Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. My name is Ron Daniels. I'm the moderator for this panel, which is AI in the 2024 election. Uh, I'm going to let our speakers introduce themselves here in a minute. And I do appreciate there's so many people here with interest in this. And so we're going to get to audience questions and answers pretty quickly tonight. Um, one thing in regard to that is I'm going to require that you come down to this microphone you see in the center aisle and form a line and ask your question there. It's being recorded. It works a lot better when we can get the audio recorded. The other ground rule I'm going to tell you is we've got a bunch of attorneys up here. Uh, you are not our clients. Uh, we are giving you legal information for general information purposes. There is no attorney-client uh, relationship created, and you can't rely on what we tell you, okay? Uh, in other words, unless you're paying us, we're not your lawyer. With that, I'm going to kick down there to the end of the panel and let Jim Nettles introduce himself. Hi, I'm Jim Nettles. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> um, I have worked in technology. I am a partner in a number. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you two can, yeah, keep sky, see, see what happens on that IP panel. Uh, um, I work in technology. I have worked in technology. I worked around politics in a lot of this area. I have worked in and around AI technologies. Some things I can talk about, some things I can't for a very long time. So I'm a consultant. So write me a check and I will be your client, or you can be my client. Versus the attorneys, they'll just take your check. It doesn't matter. Uh, with that intro, Dwayne Gatesell, I'm an IP attorney from Austin, Texas. Hi, everybody. I am have been yelled at to be talking closer to the microphone at my last panel. My name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the Vice President for U.S. Policy at the Future of Privacy Forum in Washington, D.C. My name is Corey Rosenberger. I'm an assistant district attorney in the Conestoga Judicial Circuit that is Whitfield and Murray County here in Georgia. Um, I've been an attorney for about 10 years. I, and like I said, my name is Ron Daniels. I'm an attorney down in the middle of Georgia. I do a very general practice. One other thing is if you would be so kind as to pull out your DragonCon app at some point tonight and rate this panel, it's very important to us. If you have any feedback, please give it to us. But uh, I'm just going to throw up a, a question to get our panel started. And as soon as folks in the audience have questions, please feel free to come on down. But um, I guess the operative question here is, is there room for AI safely and ethically in our elections? And whoever wants to start can start answering. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I think that we underestimate the many, many places where AI could be used. So if you even think organizationally, sometimes we think about creative uses, like I can use it to help write something, I can use it um, to help create images, very potentially straightforward, it's talking specifically um, about generative AI, because I think that's what this panel is meant to cover, but AI even broadly has uses. Um, we don't think about it helping to write policies if you're in human resources or um, in some sort of internal operations about it helping to target who you want to talk to who are the people we need to think about what is the research that i need to do helping build upon um results from generative ai which you shouldn't necessarily trust out the door you can verify them and then use them to continue um use it to continue doing research so i think there's a lot of different use cases for it it's a matter of a ensuring that um people are not misled either intentionally or unintentionally through results of generative AI so that we are um, ensuring some sort of factual um, evidence within our politicking um, and trying to figure out to what extent other rules need to be put into place. Unfortunately, the um, Federal Elections Commission has decided they are not going to um, conduct a rulemaking on the use of generative AI in elections prior to this election. So we are unlikely to get those rules. I would probably take just a little bit different tact on this. Theoretically, what you're saying is absolutely true. It can be used. The real issue for me is, does the risk outweigh that? And since the rulemaking and all of the other things, the methods by which you can verify something are going to necessarily lag, I personally think that the risk is far greater than the theoretical, practical, possible use that you mentioned. I think that the poison of this is going to happen and then we'll try to figure out the rules later on. That's my concern. I'll, I'll probably throw a little bit different tact at it and I'm going to accept for the premise of this that AI can be ethical period based on how it's been trained. So beyond that, what I would argue is yes, there are ethical ways that it can be used, but beyond the note, you know, just the general same thing we see everybody doing, you know, creating images for marketing purposes and copy and all the things that it's being used for 
Um, I think that we also need you. We need to understand the level of analytics that are being run in this election um, in terms of big data analytics, because now traditionally the big data analytics would have been crunching numbers about you and what we would have had the ability to do in 20, what year are we in? Oh yeah, 2020. What we would have been able to do in 2020 was materially stronger than 2016. Business analytics were pretty good and pretty strong then, but it was still very general. What the new AIs have been able to do is actually get it down to the point where I can profile who you are individually and have it develop content and copy specifically to target you. Um, so is that ethical? That's why we got our first question, maybe. Nope. <laughs> but it's a matter of it is. So on that note. So uh, my disclaimer is that I am not at all a uh, representative of the Department of Defense in any way, shape, or form. But uh, I do know the Department of Defense is currently using it uh, for influencing populations uh, through psychological operations. It's currently in practice in Ukraine, as well as through civil affairs activities, um, through human networking and targeting. So on that vein, right, like I think you said that uh, there wasn't going to be a ruling made on whether or not it could ethically be used in uh, an election at this point, um, do you think that with AI, like I think somebody mentioned, like you can't tell until the damage is done, like with all the misinformation that's currently out there, do you think that making a ruling after the damage is done is just going to be putting oil on a fire at that point? Or like, I mean, is, is, is that like even going to work at that point? Because once the information's out and you reach your target audience, right? The damage is already done. People are going to believe what they're going to believe. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no. It, I mean, it's a fair point. But at some point, you have to take corrective action. And it may not be this election cycle, but maybe we can prevent further damage next go around. Whether that actually happens or whether you believe the government has the capacity to do that is perhaps something entirely different. But at some point, we have to figure out not just you know, treating the symptoms, but how do you how do you affect the cause? And you know, in my opinion, it's you got to have better education. You have to have people who read. You have to get past this. I think the statistic is something like 65% of the population get their news from social media. Well, I'm sorry, that's not news. So until you have this kind of ground swelling uh, push to get back to education and civics and reading and trying to be a discerning citizen, you're going to have exactly what you're talking about. You have all of this misinformation out there, and people might believe, they might not believe, but you got to start somewhere because otherwise it just continues to spiral down. It gets worse and worse. And like to your point, your point, Jim, we're so much further along now than we were in 2020, and we're so we're so much further along in 2020 than 2016. And look what happened in 2016 with you know, the the level of technology that was several generations ago. So we've got to get back to kind of pushing how to be a discerning citizen, not to believe what's out there, take it, not take it face value, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, you gotta read and you gotta start young. Yeah, the only thing I would probably add to that, because again, I think and I think because you're in this room that puts you in that small part of the population, that means you want to understand that you're being lied to at every turn. Now, that being said, if you're following social media and that's where you're getting your information from and you're doing your researches on social media, um, you know, we, we see every day using a AI and just even Canva to go do a few snips and throw whatever you want to out there. And the next thing you know, that's fact. So I would actually argue that if we paid attention as a civilization, that's a big if, this is that moment of learning experience where we have an opportunity to become a much more discerning populace. I just don't necessarily have the hope that that's going to happen. So I think there are, just to parse out a few pieces of that question, there's the, the targeting question. So we've been able to micro-target for a long time. Um, if I wanted to five, six years ago, target somebody who rode a motorcycle and was over 65 and identified as a woman and lived in North Dakota, um, I'd probably get about two people. And I could probably tailor a message pretty specifically even at that point to those two people. So micro-targeting, 
um, you know, any advertising, let alone election advertising, is not necessarily new. What we're adding on to that is being able to, with varying degrees of accuracy, ask um, an AI, AI engine who you should micro target to. So, can you create an audience for me that I might be able to refine? Um, and then what I should tell them. Um, and again, you'll get back a, a message which you can refine. Neither, like having a message, having an audience, not new. How do we then um, put safeguards around that within certain use cases about what is a good way for that to be utilized and what is a bad way? And I, I think there are genuine, amazing ways for this technology to be utilized. Um, electoral candidates who are under-resourced um, in local elections who are trying to, with very few um, volunteers, spin up a campaign, all of a sudden you have tremendous new tools to be able to do that so long again as they are doing it within an ethical framework. And then you have, I don't know, I mean, let's just say off the top of my head that a presidential candidate were to create an image with a major pop star acting like a pop star might have endorsed that candidate. Like, that could happen, um, might not actually be um, within those ethical bounds. So on one side, you have the power that it can give under resource candidates. On another side, you have the like fairly intentional use to mislead an electoral population. And somewhere in between, I think we have to figure out where we want to use not only generative AI as a technology, but any technology within a, a democratic context. We got a question. Uh, my question is, do you have any specific example as to how this manipulation might occur in a real life scenario? Uh, because I can tell you that um, this county in Atlanta Public Schools is using two platforms for teachers to generate content and planning. Uh, so to your point about education, uh, it, it is not going to happen anytime soon. It is actually regressing and on purpose. So uh, from a legislative perspective, our laws would look at this as a product of capitalism. So how do you address that? Um, <laughs> this is free speech also, so thank you. Um, not to put in a plug, oh man, the blue papers are really far away from Here. me now. Not <laughs> to put in a plug, but there is going to be a panel, um, it's one of the yellow ones, uh, at 11.30 a.m. tomorrow on AI regulation, can Congress or the EU get it right, which actually goes to, I think, like, what is, the, what are the lawmakers doing in the AI space more generally, not just elections, but I think there are two things that I would point to. One is privacy law, which the US doesn't have, but we have um, the Future Privacy Forum has done a massive report, um, not me, so I take no credit for this, but my colleagues looked at the use of the general data protection regulation, the GDPR in the EU, and cases it had been used to regulate AI and enforced against AI uses, and came up with a very long report about how regulators were using basic privacy law to regulate AI before the, the EU AI Act was even conceived of. So there are regulatory ways to get at this. Now we have the AI Act, so I think that's the second thing to do is actually look at AI and its unique use cases outside of necessarily the data and then build in specific regulations to govern AI. And then I'd layer on top of that with the FEC has refused to do, which is look at the specific use case of elections and build on top of those um, regulations for AI within the electoral context, if they would have done that. To your point, uh, I'm from Texas. I know all about regression. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's unfortunate because what exactly you're talking about is, yes, you can have all the good intentions in the world, but when a specific political ideology, let's say, thinks that, oh, any kind of regulation, any kind of law, any kind of curtailing of freedom or whatever you call it is bad, it makes it incredibly difficult to do what is necessary as a society if we're going to survive as the society that we've known for some period of time. And so, I mean, what can you do? It's 
Amy said, you get out, you inform yourself, you talk to lawmakers, you push and say, hey, this is important, you get out and vote, and I'm confident everyone here in this room is going to do so. Uh, it is unfortunately a slow, maddening process, but people of goodwill have to get out there and push for what's right. Probably the only piece I would put here as well, because this is this is what's relevant, is this technology is evolving at such a pace Law is designed to lag behind to figure out what goes awry and try to put guardrails on it. That's part of the notion of a free society is there's a penalty to that. We're talking about a technology here that is evolving so rapidly. I mean, last year, part of one of part of the company I'm a partner in, one of the things that we did just playing around with some early stage stuff, and we and I talked about this a little bit last year, you know, we built a game engine that could take take scripting personalities generate images and everything else based on storylines. We could take, we took the exact same image, turned it into chatbots to be able to do servicing. There's nothing that says you can't do the exact same thing with a framework, put it around it and have it generate your political campaigns, have it interact as a person, all this sort of stuff. The challenge is how well you can put guardrails around it because the technology doesn't suit itself for that. And so what happens is it doesn't take much to corrupt it and all of a sudden for you to be off the rails and what's being said and represented by some of these technologies, depending on how you use them, may represent you as a candidate going back to the notion of small campaigns and you know underfunded and being able to do things. There's also ways to corrupt this very quickly. And this is something that the regulatory environment is going to have a hard time responding to because the technology is not going to suit itself unless it is so locked down as to not be usable. I think we got another question, let's, and we're getting a lot from it, so let's go. Okay, great. Um, so going back to developing a discerning citizenry and um, informing ourselves, what would you say about the role of the media in reporting on AI? Are there reporters who are particularly well-informed and uh, doing a good job of reporting on them? Any bylines we should be watching for? Or just generally, what would you say to the mainstream media about this issue? Okay, so I've been in media as a part of what I do for 35 years. I, I frequently write about these, these subjects and everything else. For the general public, most of what you see on pick your news channel, the stuff you see in most of the papers, if it bleeds, it leads. It's either designed to generate fear or sell something. Um, it takes much more work to get the reality of where these technologies are, where they lie, where they're going. And media coverage sucks because you have to remember where they're paid for by. Um, so if you ask me the, about the coverage, because I do write about it a fair amount, um, it entirely depends on who's writing the check as to what you're getting. Know what you're buying. I, I think it's always a good idea to to look up the the author of any story that you're reading. There are um, reporters out there who have just long, long histories of reporting um, really well on tech stories. I'm thinking immediately Kashmir Hill, um, who is covering right now a lot about data and cars, which is a panel that I spoke on earlier. Really wonderful reporting through the New York Times, and she has been doing this for over a decade um, of reporting. And if you see her byline and you look her up, you can see that she has many credentials on that. Um, not only will it show you a person's credentials, but I think today what becomes more important, um, thinking about generative AI, is actually making sure it is a person who has written the article. Um, unfortunately, a lot of news um, outlets are investing in generative AI to take other people's stories, repackage them, and put them up on their sites. Um, and so there, there aren't actually people writing some of these stories. So I just would encourage looking at the name and and trying to figure out who you're reading and that should inform like is this somebody that i want to invest my time in or are they real yeah i mean to that point i mean there are certain institutional organizations like the new york times like the washington post i mean there's a handful of good newspapers that have online versions that okay they've been around they have actual employees and so forth do you want to trust everything they say maybe not necessarily but they have something to lose Whereas, you know, Joe Buglehorn on whatever site, is it a real person? Does it, whatever. So I tend to, I know that makes me old, but I tend to go towards the more traditional places that I know 
they have an actual research department. They're actually doing the work. They're actually taking the time to try to figure out. I'm not 100% certain all the time, but it's better than just reading something again or seeing something on social media and assuming that, oh, this might be real, it might not be real. So I always push people towards the traditional old school news outlet like that. And, and the only reason I'm, I'm much more reluctant about that these days is because even those traditional newsrooms are going to using AIs with generated identities and even sometimes generated credentials to regurgitate these stories. Cynic. Next question. I live it. <laughs> Can you talk about some actual examples of where AI is currently being used in the 2024 election? I can give you one real quick. The DNC released a, a video that uh, used AI to generate images of Biden and Harris against this dystopian background. Um, and that's just real recently. So, yeah. Um, I wish I could type faster and pull up this candidate's name, but I actually think there, um, there's one specific story that always stands out in my mind. Um, there was a candidate, um, not for a, a federal office, um, Filipino woman, um, both of those things being, um, actually instructive here, who was, um, targeted by non-consensual generated intimate imagery. Um, in her campaign. And I think this is one of the big use cases that I worry the most about. Um, women are, what is the number? 3.4%, I think, more likely to be targeted by her, female candidates are 3.4% more likely to be targeted for harassment generally. And the qualitative evidence shows that that number goes up dramatically when it's not a white woman who is a candidate. And so there are going to be incredibly um horrible stories of generative ai images weaponized against candidates um that are absolutely um going to influence elections and they're not only going to influence candidates and in elections they're going to influence the rest of their lives and it's going to drive people out of running for election if they think that these things are going to be there and so that's my my number one worry and it's happening today there are already stories about it and the other cautionary part I would add to this, because we're already seeing this, is because you can emulate someone's voice, their likeness, and produce video clips that look, sound, and appear close enough, and because most people barely pay attention to the things that they care about, you can fake pretty much anything you want to, to an extent, and do enough to you know damage whoever your candidate is, whether it is putting on somebody's face on adult content, whether it is creating a fake Twitter channel that all of a sudden can explode and grow up and be show as verified, that is interacting as a candidate that's not them and being used to for good and bad, right? Um, but the ability to create virtual content means that we have to question everything. If it's somebody, if it's the candidate we're in favor of, we're like, oh, that's a lie. If it's the candidate we hate, we're like, see, I told you, and it gets shared about. The problem is once it exists, reality becomes very murky. And to your point, once it's out there, there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. Question. There's NIST 800 special publication series. So NIST is, um, they have an AI series now. And with the NIST publications and with when you when you log into AI, it's like gives you that this is what it does. Like, do we think that this could what NIST has shown or what other technology research companies have shown? Do you think we think do we think that this can impact future policy because of what they've seen and what they've experimented with? I'm only hesitating because I feel like I've spoken a lot. Um, the NIST, NIST has put out lots of frameworks. They're doing a lot of analysis that I think absolutely is having a positive impact on this space. Um, absent regulatory requirements, it's having what I would say a positive impact for the people who want to do the right thing, um, or want to not face secure or scrutiny by regulators for doing the wrong thing. So either they're, they're well-intentioned or they're well-intentioned enough to try to avoid negative attention um, that they're trying to do the right thing. Um, there are 
several companies that I think are specifically geared toward um, less scrupulous uses, um, like putting out tools that can be used for specific things. So I talked about, for instance, non-consensual um, generative intimate imagery. There are entire companies that exist just to do that. Um, and so those people are not going to be um, persuaded, I think, by NIST guidelines or best practices, but best practices will help the people, the big companies, the people who are trying to put in place the right thing. And I think it's um, what NIST has been doing has been really great, trying to elevate risks and, and look at um, guidelines and principles for, for practice. To that point, I, I think it's interesting. It's kind of like your front door lock, you know, it's only good to keep out the good people who aren't going to otherwise break the door down. Yeah, honest and lazy. <laughs> so I mean, AI platforms are being consolidated by a number of large providers and a, a number of them have pledged, it hasn't happened yet, but they've pledged to start watermarking content so that if something is AI created and it's used later, then it shows up as an AI creation. And to that, to Amy's point, that might be something that will help also, but it depends on the goodwill of the platform creators. And so hopefully they will be pressured into doing exactly that. So that if I grab AI content from one place and I use it for something else, it's gonna show up, oh, this is artificially created. It's not genuine. We're not there yet, but it's something that a lot of the platforms have pledged to do. It just hasn't happened yet, but hopefully with pressure and with regulation and so forth, it'll, it'll get to that point, but again, not yet. And the other thing I would add to this is not necessarily about the AI generation itself, because again, if it is a somebody not underneath those regulations, but you know, coming through to share material in a given market in a given place, doesn't matter what's regulatory stuff. A lot of it is going to, I think, ultimately boil down to the platforms themselves and finding responsibility for content that is being shared out. And this is both, I think, a an obligation of the platforms that are delivering the content, whether that is your social media platforms, whether that is email and spam, whether that's texts, regardless of what it is. But the other challenge then becomes, because we've seen this, is once that begins, is we tend to go and overcorrect or undercorrect materially to the point where even valid and legitimate information then becomes more restricted because of how it was potentially generated. Before we take your question, Corey, can you comment just briefly on maybe some of the, from a legally enforceable perspective of when somebody uses AI, generative AI in a campaign for some of these bad things that Amy's talked about, such as targeting a candidate in that mm -hmm. way, what sort of recourses do we as people have? So I don't, uh, Thinking off the top of my head, I, I don't, I can't think of any crime um, that has occurred. I'm sure that there's one out there. There's a crime for just about everything now. Um, but um, it, certainly in the civil aspect, it would be, um, it, it, you would be able to, you know, I, yeah, I don't know how much damage, damages wise you would get, um, um, I guess the cost of an election. Um, but uh, I, I, as far as an actual crime, I don't think that we're there yet, um, at least on making a video, a, a likeness of somebody without their consent. Now we'll move to question. Um, so you talked about watermarks on AI images, and I was wondering what you thought about AI detection software. Jim, I'm going to let you go. So here's what I will say is the AI detection software is improving. But again, it can only respond to the software that exists. That is an arms race that you will always be behind on. And this is like anything else is that it will find and detect what it can recognize. Now, some of the things that there have been arguments for within the industry is embedding and some of them, some of them are already doing this embedding things into images and even into copy that will flag it as having been generated through a generative AI system. The scoring systems, if it's written words, suck. Um, because honestly, the written word scoring, the systems have gotten much better about the content they generate. Um, still not great, 
this is this is the writer in me coming out. The content they generate is still not great, but if it's short enough, there's usually not a large enough sample size. In images, it's it's still pretty good, but the that 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 fight is is escalating so quickly. Images are getting better and better, and this is on an hourly basis. This is not even daily. This is on an hourly basis. The technology is improving. And so the kinds of defects are being fixed very quickly. So the things that you could program a scanning software to look for are changing so rapidly, it's hard to find the different kinds of defects. They can find and flag a lot of stuff, but we're also seeing a tremendous amount of false positives. Got another question. Sure. Um, thank you. And this is addressing a um, panel of, uh, I take it, mostly legal experts. And given that you guys have already mentioned that uh, the technology is evolving rapidly, uh, there are no regulations on the book right now, and this year is an election year already. Um, I'm curious what you guys think, um, what either one of you think when regulation does come, if you can speak to uh, your prediction for when's the soonest we can get any kind of law or regulation on the book, and what type of shape you think it will take? There are laws. So the EU has the AI Act. It's, it's not enforced yet, but it has passed. It is moving toward implementation date. Um, Colorado has passed an AI law. Um, I will talk more about this tomorrow, but spoilers for those of you coming tomorrow. Colorado did a very cute thing where they passed the, AI, the law after EU, um, the EU AI Act, but they have decided they were going to have an enforcement date before the EU AI Act goes into force. So they will still technically be the first active AI law. Um, so uh, that it will be out of Colorado. California, I believe, has passed an AI law at this point, but it hasn't been signed. Like it is actively work working through the process as we sit here. Um, so there are regulations specific to AI that I think are really important um, to recognize, and they're going to provide really important protections, particularly around um, bias within AI systems, which is a huge pervasive problem um, that the, the regulations are specifically designed to address somewhat. Um, there will not be election specific regulations out of the FEC. Um, it is probably worth noting that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, is currently in a rulemaking process to label any um, content that they have jurisdiction over, so television or radio ads. Um, that use that contain generative AI um, have to be labeled as having generative AI. So they're in the rulemaking process. They've accepted comments on it. The FEC is very angry about this. They say that the FCC does not have jurisdiction to do it. They say that they have exclusive jurisdiction to do this. They have said that they are also not going to do anything. So there is a jurisdictional battle happening in DC between these two agencies. We might get some small bit of rules from the FCC. Um, I will say our worry is that if we have certain television and radio ads that are labeled as containing generative AI, but you have internet ads that don't and don't have to say if they're containing generative AI, that it can create confusion where people just assume that the internet ads don't have it because they don't say it and they see it in, in other types of advertising. U.S. federal regulation. I guess yeah. There, there are states that have some stuff. But what's the soonest you think we will have? Any, yeah, who's going to win the election? <laughs> well, and the, and the question was, uh, when do you think we might have some sort of federal regulation uh, on generative AI in elections? Mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm not trying to be flip about it because the two parties are going to take a completely different view as to whether one is necessary or not. Um, I think Biden issued an executive order October or December, mm -hmm. but that's not a law, right? So who wins is going to dictate whether that executive order is rescinded or <laughs> the government's told to ignore that. So the, and this is something we'll talk about tomorrow also, but the, the U.S. executive order mirrors, in some respects, the EU law on this. It doesn't go as far. It's not. It's more. You know, okay, we're going to leave it to to private industry somewhat. It's a start, and hopefully they'll use that as a basis to say, 
okay, now we need to make a more expansive law rather than just relying on an executive order that could be gone tomorrow. So to answer your question, again, I'm not trying to be flip. It really is going to depend. And depending on who wins, maybe they take the executive order and push that forward you know, next year. Not to be kind of um, dramatic or pessimistic, but a lot of times it takes some sort of tragedy or um, some sort of horrible event um, that will can push people and especially legislators to to appeal their their voting voting base to do something. And so it might just have to be have to wait until, you know, AI is used to do something horrible. You mean more? Oh, wait, more, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like ruin the reputation of a female who's running. Her it, it, well, I guess I, I guess I should say publicly uh, and well known through mainstream media. Yeah. Maybe not to throw the water on this, but I mean, would, could something such as that happen? The, the party that thinks they should win loses, and they decide that they lost because of AI, and so they say we're going to outlaw it. I mean, is that a possibility? I, I don't know that you can put the genie back in the bottle. You can yeah. you can try, um, uh, but. Yeah. I, I would argue that there's a lot of movement trying to put that genie back in the bottle and cut it out. But the problem is now, if you if you went tomorrow and said AI is now illegal, period, generative AI because of, you know, we've decided because of how the engines were trained, all the other issues that go around it, there is no more AI. You just shut down the world because it is now so embedded in every system you're using, whether you know it or not, that... Because every CEO just said, I heard about this AI thing. Let's plug a robot in because it may save me money. Let me do other stuff. So that's going to be the first challenge. And what I would say, one of the things that we were seeing some of last year was there was motivation from social media platforms, news agencies, and everything else to start to curtail a lot of the AI material because it was flooding everything and there was no real social engagement left. It was all bots creating, bots creating. So it was flooding the platform. So the platforms did some things to help moderate that sum. But uh, what I would say is it, we may be as de dependent on the platforms to help moderate this as much as any, as much as law and regulation, because the challenge with regulation becomes, and there are some aspects to this with the EU laws and what, what's been passed. Um, that will probably have some material in, um, unintended consequences just because of how the technology works. We may see, you know, entire states or entire countries where it gets turned off because they're going to say, oh, well, we can't comply with that the way this works. So Utah just no longer gets, or Colorado just no longer gets access to chat GPT, which means you just shut down a ton of business and industry because of the knockoff. Got a question. You've discussed the actual use of AI a lot in politics, but what about um, sort of baseless accusations of use of AI, like a, like attacking a political component uh, opponent, uh, or accusing them of using AI um, in order to like sow mistrust for them? Like, how do we grapple with that, or what, how do we address that legally when it's fundamentally, I guess, a free speech issue? Um, I don't think that they're there's not necessarily a way uh, they spoke about it. They touched on it earlier is just educating the voter base um, and and ev just everyone in general being more aware of the risks. Because, uh, I mean, I can go and, you know, on my phone, say, you know, show me a picture of Kamala Harris doing this um, and it'll make an image and it could be on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook in 15 minutes. Um, short up uh, i think that the solution to that specific problem is either with the watermarks if that you know goes through some some very very easy way um or just everybody you know educating the general population about ai and you know everyone being naturally skeptical when they get on their phones i mean it's interesting we've talked about actual Generated generative AI images used to mislead and making sure you know that there are generative AI images, but we haven't talked about images that are not generative AI images 
and somebody comes out and says, well, that was, that wasn't my voice. I never said that that was created by, and mm -hmm. your watermarking won't pick like the absence of a watermark won't necessarily be, be heard or seen. Um, and we ask like the more we call into question the content that everybody is out there, the more people will see being able to call things into question as a tool that they can use. Um, and, and unfortunately, that is the one of the harder things to regulate because you're regulating the absence of something. Um, and so education really is there. I think one of the biggest responses you can see. Um, I will also say one of my worries, because I think watermarking is a great thing that we should be talking about more. But does anybody have the like the Ray-Bans, like the meta Ray-Bans glasses that speak to you or or any sort of audio AI that you interact with on a regular, anybody here use that? Sure, yeah. Like you, you're asking through the audio and you're never seeing text basically. Like they are moved, like big companies are moving very quickly to that being AI generated. It's not just um, Siri or assistants, they're incorporating AI into that. And people tend to actually like, believability goes up when it's audio for some, like we've, we've incorporated a skepticism into what we read but when something is being read to us, we we tend to believe it more and you, it's harder to watermark the active audio content as it's coming through and it's harder to label it because it's audio content. And that is one of those really sticky problems right now that I'm convinced there has to be some sort of solution for, but I have no idea what it is. And I think that's like a really interesting thing that we're gonna have to get into fast because these tools are being incorporated into our, our audio inputs. We just have to make sure they never use a British accent because <laughs> believability goes way up with a British accent. Oh, that person's really educated. So. No, no, no. Scottish accent that way because nobody will understand it. But I think also um, a, one sort of quasi solution to that as well is putting it on um, is increased social media regulation as well. Um, and which is another thing that are that we woefully lack right now um and holding them accountable to at least somewhat make it very easy and very fast to be able to flag a post flag something is and you know warn you know other users hey that you might need to fact check this not censor it but you know at least put some sort of warning on there um that you know you might want to take a double double check your sources on this. And, and yeah, the only other thing I would add, because again, the challenge here again becomes the technology is evolving very rapidly. We can pass regulations, which means those ethical organizations, ethical companies can do things that will watermark and highlight when this is AI. That will solve a lot of the teenager in the basement that just wants to, you know, stir up mayhem. What we still can't deal with are the state actors that have technologies that won't pass those regulations that we still have to deal with those as well. And that, that is, so while the teenager or, you know, the grump, you know, the grumpy old guy who's like, get off my lawn. I don't like my, you know, I don't like my councilman. I'm gonna start up, you know, some sort of an AI campaign for a reason. These technologies and the things that we are making commercial. And one of the things I would argue we've got to do more of is find ways to put a little bit more of a gateway and a little bit more friction into using some of these tools, because if we put a little more friction into using the tools, it will help slow down the laziest bad actors, which try and crank out a lot of the garbage. What that means is now we have to encourage the real bad actors to work a little harder. Got a question. Um, kind of building on what Mr. Nettles just said and this whole discussion um, and Mr. Dwayne, earlier, you mentioned discerning readers. It seems to me that the prevalence of the internet and social media at this point in time, combined with freedom of the press and ease of access and capitalism has all kind of reached a critical mass of, you have these multiple disjointed pipelines trying to get your attention in whatever way and people are trying to grow people are trying to grow revenue and organizations business entities um, are trying to unite and 
use that as a way to grow some even more. And these AI tools have now just become another leveraged tool in all of this. It kind of seems to me that on a high thousand foot level, it's not tenable to really, really control this now that the rabbit's out of the box. Um, so to me, it either seems one of two ways. It's either complete paradigm shift in how journalism is handled. We've already kind of seen this with YouTube journalism taking off where uh, traditional organizations are dying left and right. So it becomes a cult of personality where uh, Annie, you, you spoke about this earlier, you're following individuals, not organizations, or we become so heavily regulated in the space that you essentially created a nation run journalistic site in order to have it follow those regulations and be trusted. I don't know that either one of those is an improvement on the situation because you now have cults of personality and or you have what the freedom of the press was meant to combat in the first place. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem, but I don't think it's necessarily an either or. I don't think it between those two extremes, I, I think there is room for saying, yes, we can have some regulation to try to, as Jim said a second ago, tamp down the, the worst of the bad actors. Is it ideal? No. Is it perfect? No. But what's the alternative? To give up and go, yeah, everybody do what you want to do. There's no laws. We don't have to worry about libel. We don't have to worry about slander. We don't have to worry about privacy rights. We don't have to worry about personality rights, any of that. I, some things are worth fighting for. And so I would disagree with the premise that it's an either or. I think we have to find some way to work on it. And are people going to slip through? Yeah, as long as there are bad actors, and that's only been around since, I don't know, maybe five million years or so. Um, that's going to continue to be the situation. But it's still a fight worth fighting for. And I don't think we should wash our hands and say it's one or the other to your question. We just got to keep whittling away. Go ahead. So there are a lot of conversations that I've already been in here at DragonCon um, talking about uh, data brokers and targeted advertising. And um, there are a lot of advocacy groups, I think, for many good reasons that have been pushing about out back against targeted advertising as a business model. I actually think journalism is our best use case for why targeted advertising has a place. Um, because if you move to contextual advertising, what we find is no company wants to be the company that's the ad next to the um, horrific criminal story on the front page of the newspaper. They don't choose to do like you can't find a contextual ad to go next to major news. Um, so targeted advertising actually helps fund some of these journalistic models um, that you can't get through other means of advertising. Now, we haven't actually gotten to the point where we're funding them well because advertising is majorly suffering, particularly at the state and local, or sorry, advertising is journalism is major. You suffer <laughs> suffering. That was not what I meant to say, um, especially at the state and local level. Um, but I think if we shifted away from that model altogether, the um, lack of funding into journalism would go up quite significantly. Um, and what we need to be doing is shifting money back into state and local journalism and increasing the amount of news and increasing the amount of reporting that we're getting. So there is actually a relatively simple solution for a lot of this. Number one is that you require everyone to have a verified identity online so that every transaction is logged to you and your personal identity. The second, <laughs> the second is that for every social media platform you use, you have to pay a dollar a month. That combination would lock things down and eliminate a tremendous amount of all of this because, number one, you would then be able to tra trace back and source exactly the person who something came from. Number two, that would eliminate the bot farms and so many of the useless IDs because if they had to pay a dollar a month, if you can't create a free account, you can't spin up 100 free accounts to go create a movement. So if you got to pay a buck a month, if it costs you nothing to do it, but if it then that cost became a hundred dollars, 
to do that on a bot farm, those two things will lock it down. Are y'all ready to do that? To have everything you do and say online tra trace back to your identity? Well, that's an excellent question. The government, trust them. They're here to help. Hey, Amy, I know you're in favor of digital tracing every single individual. I mean, you're shutting down dissent. You're shutting down um, people who are protesting against the government. You are not preventing people from spinning up bot farms. You're preventing poor people from spinning up protest farms. Um, the billionaires and millionaires out there who are definitely trying to have political um, positioning and get their positions out are still going to be able to afford $100 a month as if it were nothing. Um, apologies, I worked on human rights issues for six years and I just, I, sorry. <laughs> I didn't ever said prevent, I said it would cut it down. Nothing will ever prevent it because if you have money, it's a tool. Next question. So um, since we have lessons learned from 2016 and we saw not only the US elections, but also South American elections and other elections also affected by early AI and bot farm based manipulation um, and recognizing that we in America don't process it, but there's a lot of near America uh, countries, I would use the word democracy questionably, um, but they host a lot of AI data centers, et cetera, et cetera. And what that really means then is that there's a lot of threat actors out there that are external to US law. So the question becomes, how do you write the law so that the FBI or the FTC or whoever can enforce said law to go after these bad actors? I mean, the crypto world saw this when, you know, there was a massive crypto heist two or three years ago and by follows Darknet Diaries, probably heard him talk about it. Um, and they ended up, you know, going after the US based offices of the crypto exchange to find the crypto wallets of the bad guys. And then they went internationally to countries where they could extradite from, found these people as they flew in and then arrested them. And it's a very nebulous thing. We're talking about speech versus money. But how else do you control this? Because to, trying to control data is, is impossible. Right. And to, and to make a point to that, my suggestion about having to register every, that would have to be a global thing, right? You're logged, logged to your one unit, your one ID. This would have to be a global thing. And again, state actors are going to get around that. If you have enough capital, you can get around anything. Um, I think part of the point here is we're back to be discerning. So an executive order that was issued this year that got less attention than the AI executive order, but is incredibly important. The, the Department of Justice is working on implementing it now um, was about limiting the ability for companies to transfer or store data in certain what are called countries of concern. Um, and it's specifically trying to get at this AI question about how massive databases are either being um, voluntarily by companies who do business in a lot of areas and have many data centers um, and are sending it underneath a country's jurisdiction or um, are creating databases that are up for sale and certain countries are purchasing those databases in some way. Um, and they're trying to limit that because they're seeing it as a national security threat because that data is being used to train um, artificial intelligence. So they are looking at what are the things that we need to do to respond to these threats in certain limited ways. And the rulemaking for that, I believe we're expecting in October. So if anybody wants to respond to federal rulemaking um, and follows the federal register, mark your October calendars. I know I have. Um, so that is, I, I think, a really important piece of this is just trying to figure out where data goes, who's getting these massive databases, who we're allowing to benefit from this massive amount of data. Unfortunately, this is necessary because as I will say to anybody who wants to talk to me this weekend, the US does not have a federal comprehensive privacy law and we are now having to backfill on national security issues because we haven't actually protected data in the first place. All right, we got five minutes left, but this is probably gonna be our last question. 
go. So, to your point, isn't it time to push for an amendment to our constitution? For what? To include privacy, to address technology, to address the differences of human. Um, so I'm not going to say no, because it's not that I don't agree, but we haven't been able to pass a privacy law that takes less members to vote for it. So I have like, if we can get to the point where we can actually put legislation into place, we might be able to talk about what else we can do. But because a constitutional amendment requires so much, even more than what a law passes and we haven't gotten to a law, I would have. I want to at least get something um, on the books, but I think eventually we have talked about like taking the Fourth Amendment, which only applies to government and extending it to. Corporate sector, creating some sort of right vis a vis the corporate sector, even if it's not the same thing um, that has been circulated many times. It just is a huge um, mountain to climb to get to the point where that would have support and be able to, to pass. It'll be interesting to see, because like with the privacy law, Europe passed their privacy law first, and we don't have a law in place. But what happened is most companies said, oh, OK, Europe is a, is a key trading partner. They're setting the bar here for privacy law. So we're going to have to follow and adhere to the European privacy law. So you kind of saw corporations towing the line, even though we didn't have the law here. It'll be interesting to see if something similar happens with the EU on this particular issue, if others say, oh, okay, Europe has this law, that's important to us, we're gonna, again, follow along, even in the absence of a law here. I hope that, okay, if nothing else, that will happen, but hopefully, like you said, hopefully we'll start with a law. I have no hope of a, of a constitutional amendment for anything at this point, but let's just, let's start small, get a law in place, and if nothing else, maybe, hopefully, private companies will follow along, if nothing else. And in the EU, data protection is a fundamental human right, is recognized and accepted as a fundamental human right in the EU and in other countries, which is important. Yeah. And I personally am more concerned about privacy and data protections in many ways than AI, because AI, that genie's out of the bottle and running amok. We'll kind of close with a couple final remarks from everybody. We'll start with Corey and just go down the line. Um, don't believe what you read on the internet. <laughs> what? Um, support your vulnerable and historically marginalized candidates um, and go to bat for them because they are going to be very at risk in the, the coming years. Vote. Vote, read, contact your representatives, tell them what's important, and tell your uncle he's wrong. I, I think the it, it's discernment. We're back to discernment and be aware that the tech is here, tech is changing, and we, we have to be responsible for ourselves. All right, and thank you all for coming. If you would, give a round of applause to our panelists. If you would also give a round of applause to the hardworking volunteers that helped put us on. Don't forget to rate the this panel in the DragonCon app so we can keep bringing things like this back to you next year. Thanks. <laughs>